listeners, and welcome to our latest podcast, Get Smarter. I'm your host, Charlotte Anderson, Senior Instructional Designer with Lifecycle Engineering. Recent podcast episodes have targeted general management best practices in the asset management and reliability space. Our guests discussed aligning lifecycle asset management with capital planning, using a structured approach to change and following a path to a smart culture. We continue that theme of practical guidance today as we learn more about ESG, the environmental factors, social criteria, and governance principles behind sustainability programs. Our guest today is Paul Borders, Senior Principal Consultant and Author with Lifecycle Engineering and over 30 years of experience in our industry. Welcome to Get Smarter, Paul Borders. Well, thank you. It's good to be here, Charlotte. Great. Great to have you here again, Paul. Climate change remains a subject of real controversy, and that's not what we're discussing today. What is it about ESG that makes it a distinct topic, irrespective of climate change? Hmm. That's a creative way to, to ask the question. Um, you know, in my, in my own mind, I, I think of climate change as controversial, it's a bit fuzzy, it's quite nebulous, somewhere off in the future, and it has become so politicized that it's difficult to have a rational discussion around it. But in, in juxtaposition to that, um, I would say that the ESG movement is very real. It's impacting manufacturers right now. It's shaping strategy right now. And, you know, I, I guess I'd love to point out up front that this discussion is not really about whether climate change is real or not. You know, we certainly understand that passions run hot on both sides of that argument. But what we really want to get across to our listeners today is to share our perspective. I and mean, we're out there in industry and plants all the time, and we're, we're certainly uniquely positioned to see across lots of different industries and see how they're responding to the emerging set of pressures uh, from the very real ESG movement. It's been quite striking for me as a professional in this space that, wow, there's, there's a lot of different pressure points um, coming to bear on uh, today's manufacturing leaders. So you really have an on the ground view, and I think that's going to be very helpful for our listeners. So let's begin by level setting our listeners understanding of how most manufacturers have responded to the public's expectations about sustainability in recent years. What have you been seeing? Well, it's all over the map, uh, Charlotte. You know, I, I could describe probably a continuum where one fear, one set of the uh, continuum is a very fear-based and people are threatened by it. And on the other end of the continuum, we have uh, optimism and opportunity. I think the, uh, the, the, the companies that are making the most progress are the ones that are honing in on the possibility and the opportunity that's being created. So, you know, I, I, I'm prepared to talk about several different um, uh, companies that we're around that, that, are, that are responding in very different ways. Um, I'm on airplanes a lot, and Delta Airlines has been a company that um, really, uh, you know, in, in one sense, that threat is highly vulnerable to Delta, right? I mean, these are folks that, you know, buy gazillion uh, uh, gallons of jet fuel and then directly inject it into the atmosphere. So there's like no more vulnerable um, uh, climate change visual image of of a threat, right? But Delta's been very, very, very interesting. They've gone through and calculated. They've really emphasized like how um, carbon efficient it is. If you're going to travel across country, then your carbon footprint's lower if you jump on a jet with a bunch of other people and uh, go to Los Angeles. Um, they have uh, carbon offsets, uh, which has allowed them to um, uh, to really uh, you know, allow some of their more conscientious customer base to uh, fly and achieve carbon neutrality on their own uh, interactions with Delta. Um, the old company that I used to work for, uh, Owens Corning, is another example. They probably really started their sustainability efforts in earnest, probably, uh, probably 18, 17 years ago. And they started off relatively simply getting their 
own house in order and getting their corporate headquarters lead certified to make it a, a officially a green building. But that, as they gained experience and a skill set in the ESG uh, space, and they had some great leadership, but they really started to um, make really, really, really significant efforts across their operations. So, and, and Owens Corning is a very interesting one, but because they, they have tremendous vulnerability in the sense that they burn a tremendous amount of gas, they have a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide uh, production at their sites, but yet their product making uh, residential and commercial insulation can very much be part of the solution uh, for ESG. So, uh, so they've really uh, worked to, again, uh, make their own house um, as clean as possible in their own plants and operations as possible while sharing the very good news about insulation and, uh, and, the, and the, the benefits of their product, um, you know, when they're used extensively. Uh, we do a lot of work in the metal space and we're seeing uh, lots of different res differential responses in the metals realm. Um, uh, for example, we've got uh, clients in the copper business and the copper business is an interesting one because the, the trend in the, the government incentivization for, uh, for electric vehicles to go, the, the, the mandate or the, the implication is that an electric vehicle has five times more copper in it than a conventional vehicle, right? So they've got to make more copper uh, to meet the demand uh, as the national fleet uh, converts at a timeline that's subject to debate over to copper. So they see opportunity, right? Uh, again, that other end of the, the continuum where price and demand is really high. They see lots of opportunity um, and their, their strategy is really uh, both manufacturing and their ESG strategy is to supply the copper for those markets, uh, but also to make as much copper as they can while they uh, while they're enjoying high price, so there's that 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 two sided coin uh, to many of the companies. And you know, the farther into the realm that you go, whether you're a lithium manufacturer or germanium or gallium, uh, there is a ton of different implications on these metal spaces within the um, or these metals impact and role in uh, the different um, sustainability and, and overall sort of green conversion. So it's really got a, a, a pretty dramatic and variable impact depending upon where you sit and depending upon the, the, the leadership and their response to the pressures that they're seeing. You chose uh, two really great examples, I think, that our listeners uh, can relate to, one being very visible in the airline industry with Delta, and also with a recognizable name of uh, Owens Corning. And what I took away, uh, some of what I took away from you included that these are intentional decisions that leadership is making uh, about how they're going to run their business. It's not necessarily based in... Uh, an environmental goal as it is in asset management and using their equipment to the best of its ability uh, and maximizing that. Uh, yeah. I also heard you talk about leadership and that the influence of uh, positive leadership is crucial to their success. And the anecdotes you provided are decades old. So uh, we know it's not a new topic for manufacturers. Oh, no question. Well, I, I think that there, um, you know, plenty of studies have shown that there is sustainable um, and positive impact when you pursue um, environmental and sustainability goals. And they also have a real positive uh, uh, impact on the uh, business performance. And, and while that's, that is certainly present as a truth out there, but I would tell you that there is definitely not everybody is at that point, right? Um, we have uh, some clients that, that, that I really won't mention by name, but they're extremely fearful of what's going on within the um, ESG arena um, and, and the threat that it, that it represents. You know, if you, if you sort of back, um, back the clock up uh, and think through the COVID uh, pandemic and when the COVID pandemic hit, 
and essentially the global powers uh, that, that were to be uh, got together and they essentially decided that we were gonna throw trillions of dollars of public spending uh, to, to keep our economies from sinking during the COVID environment. Uh, the World Economic Forum uh, got together and they essentially um, uh, postulated this uh, initiative or a phrase called the Great Reset. And in short, it just said, let's, let's build our economies for the future, not just throw these dollars out there, but let's incentivize the things that enhance um, uh, ESG or positive ESG performance. And the, the, the result also was that they were gonna be very hesitant about investing in dirty uh, old school industries and making the, uh, carbon, um, uh, the carbon or decarbonization challenge is that much more difficult. So, so there's been a, 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 you know, what I would call some really, really tough impacts. And after that whole um, World Economic Forum and the Great Reset, there, there was lots of implications on that. And, you know, I think, I think first and foremost, one of the things that's been uh, visible to our customers, and we're hearing this directly from them, is that they are seeing sweeping changes in the capital markets that are now showing up with ESG criteria for them to invest or not to invest. Um, and, you know, whenever you've got more than a few people involved, there are more rigid and there are more extreme people uh, that represent uh, that are that are in those discussions and I would say that you know some of the statements that I've seen coming from the more rigid or extreme members of the financial community have said you know hey our, our governments are being very ineffective in in bringing about decarbonization so in the financial communities we're gonna we're gonna kill off brown and dirty industries and we're only going to invest in clean and, and green industries, right? So if you're um, sitting on the board or, uh, or an executive in one of these um, older school, high heavy carbon footprint um, industries, you know, that's a, that's a, a tremendously um, foreboding messaging to come out of the capital markets that, that, uh, that this is, um, you know, could be uh, Dr. Death coming to visit your, your business, right? So, so, and, and then that in turn has spilled over into a huge debate within the financial communities that are now debating their fiduciary responsibilities that they have to their investors, as well as potential classes with their own um, ESG uh, ideology that might be in there. So suffice it to say that among some of our clients there's panic in the streets, uh, panic in the streets in many industries. Um, in very old and long-standing successful industries are now being threatened and they may not have had meaningful ESG strategies underway and they're having to learn the carbon trading market and hiring attorneys on, on how to navigate that realm. And this is especially true in companies um, that have uh, facilities in Europe where there are um, some pretty um, uh, challenging uh, carbon reduction uh, footprints out there with time-based milestones. So it's a, uh, it's a super, uh, super challenging environment. And the bottom line is that a lot of the old pressure points that our, that our clients used to have, like market share and margin and, um, and efficiency, are now being, um, uh, uh, there's now additional ESG pressure points being added to that uh, very familiar list of pressure points. I really like all the points you made, Paul, because what I hear is that uh, the desired outcome of a positive ESG influence means we actually have a lot of alignment and some shared goals between manufacturers, the financial community, consumers, investors, uh, environmental folks. It's in everybody's best interest to pursue this uh, if they want their business to succeed and they want consumers to be happy and satisfied. They probably are seeing an effect of uh, employee retention as well, because we want to work for companies who are doing right by their communities. So what's missing, Paul? Well, you know, because we've got this unique perspective um, in seeing trends across lots of different industries. One thing that's really striking from, from my perspective and some of my colleagues' perspective is that people are not seeing the link between high quality asset management and, and progress in their reliability realm um, and, and their ESG. They've almost compartmentalized those, 
uh, those realms differently. And our, I guess a major message point I'd love to get across to our listeners, listeners today is that when you really strip things down and look, the very same things that you do to improve asset performance and asset life are the very same things that are going to um, empower your ESG efforts. So, you know, it, it, you know, so whatever you're doing to assets to improve their performance, it always has a benevolent effect on what's making your ESG performance. Uh, so I'll, I'll color that uh, statement out with a couple of examples. So if you think about a, a pump, right, you can have a, a very poorly maintained pump, um, not well specified for its application. It's sucking a lot of energy and it's doing a very poor job and your yields are compromised because of that. But if you take a, a highly reliable um, approach to that same pumping system and it's a well-maintained pump, it's, it's running in its designated pumping range, you're not only operating well, but you're using le less electricity and you're optimizing the long-term lifespan of that, of that pump itself, right? So it's not being pulled out of service prematurely. So you're getting a good 10 year life out of that pump. And instead of the two years that if you rode it hard and put it up wet. So, you know, the carbon footprint that, that was um, involved in making that pump to begin with now might have to be replicated a number of times because you're not getting the life cycle of that original pump. And another example that's much closer to home is you can think about your own car for this, right? If you, if you drive your own car uh, conservatively and care for it properly, keep your tires properly inflated and it's well lubricated and it's a well-maintained machine, you'll enjoy great gas mileage for the time you own it. And it's probably gonna last you closer to the 20 year time frame. Another scenario is where you drive it like like it's a rental right no ditch too deep and no uh, curb too high and you wear that thing slap out in 10 years again that the 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 carbon footprint that's involved in making that that second car that you would be running for the 10 years instead of giving the full lifespan out of that original 10 is now uh, incurred by by you as an individual consumer but it's also incurred by society as we as we absorb the carbon um, uh, that's, uh, that's generated for that. So, you know, so there's lots of examples like that, but really the, the, the major point is that, you know, when you, when you um, treat assets well and lower their total life cycle cost, you're also putting wind in the sails of your ESG efforts. And it doesn't exist just to, um, or it doesn't apply just to assets. You know, for example, if you've got uh, capital project delivery processes and you build high levels of reliability into the design, that means that the inputs to that installation are minimized over its life cycle. So uh, again, the carbon footprint for that designated installation is much lower than if you'd had a very poorly designed system uh, go in. So, so those are some of the, um, some of the examples that, uh, that I think are, are missing from the discussion um, within the ESG realm right now. Well, it sounds like no matter what we talk about uh, when it concerns our manufacturing partners, uh, it always comes back to asset performance at, at some point. That's always part of the conversation. Yeah, uh, so. That and uh, the capital planning that goes along with it. I mean, it, we saw it when we talked about change management and uh, improved safety, improved competitiveness, uh, resilience to the market, reduced maintenance costs, fewer emergency interruptions. And now we're hearing benefits from uh, your asset performance plan being part of your ESG success. So in a practical sense, what does it mean for our manufacturing clients and partners? Hmm. Well, I, I would say that if I distilled that down to a single bullet point, it would mean that pursuing reliability improvements and high level asset performance greatly benefit today's, today's operational performance and your today's financial results. And it also adds so much credibility to your ESG story. So that's, 
I would say is the single point there. And that's true. Like you said, it's something you can start today from wherever you are. Uh, there's always room to grow and improve, but you can actually start it today, irrespective of its impacts on your uh, ESG program or planning. Uh, but like you said, the consumer wants credibility from the manufacturer, and uh, I think you're giving that. Well, you know, and, and that's a great point because so many corporations have put together a sustainability web page or or and they they use lots of green ink uh you know to to talk about that but it, it's a paper tiger there there are not significant aspects to their esg program and they're they're really more fluff pieces uh that uh that are that are not very weighty so you know again our our messaging is that the the real concrete things that you do to assets um, in long-term installations are are so consistent between uh, high levels of asset management and um, and reliability and uh, strong, credible ESG performance. Well, it sounds like there will be uh, some definite practical implications of not adopting ESG practices. So, do you see it as an issue of staying competitive? Uh, gaining a competitive advantage or something else? You know, I, I think I think many people still have have questions about how much teeth is the ESG um, uh, movement going to have over the long haul, right? And as we're experiencing a hot uh, summer like we are across the United States and and in the South, that that that, that pressure seems to be building. Um, you know, and, and I would tell you that I think some manufacturers can probably stick their head in the sand and just can ignore meaningful waste reduction efforts in their locations, and they can buy carbon credits on the on the market if they if they can afford them, right? <laughs> um, but I we think, and I personally think that those pressures are only going to grow um, over time, and I think those pressures are only going to get worse. Uh, for manufacturers, and I, I don't think that's the the singular pressure point there. I there, there's a lot of change underway that's occurring uh, due to geopolitical reasons, which I think are also some threats for companies. And you know, right now what we're seeing is that uh, there's a, a real reshoring of U.S. based manufacturing because we saw in COVID. Uh, those supply chains just may not be as robust um, as we thought that they were. And as, as manufacturers are getting horribly um, uh, punished by supply chain performance and so forth, as well as the international behavior of China, uh, there being a, a very, very, very self-serving um, uh, nation um, with respect to uh, their own interests, and uh, people are voting with their feet. They're, they're moving a lot of capacity into Mexico. There's a reshoring effort uh, going on here within the United States. And, and the bottom line of all that reshoring here in the US is that um, there's gonna be a lot more new plants, new technology, um, much more efficient technology and much lower carbon footprints that now a lot of these old legacy uh, manufacturers are going to be having to compete with. So not only are they going to be having to deal with the ESG pressures, but they're going to have to be competing with, with a, a much um, a newer set of uh, manufacturing producers here in the United States and in Mexico uh, because uh, uh, the amount of, of, um, of uh, international trade uh, might be threatened under the the current reshoring shoring work. So, so it's a so it's an unknown time. But uh, the bottom line is, um, we think that everybody's best interest is um, is best served if they uh, do things right the first time, conserve energy. Right. That's right. It's not just uh, the economic pressure, as you mentioned earlier, uh, and manufacturers who are a little bit slow to make their operations more efficient. Uh, they might be able to skirt it for a little while, um, but like you said, nothing beats uh, asset management and intentional planning. Well, I agree. So how do you suggest businesses prioritize their efforts? Well, I think there's lots of, 
lots of ways to do that. But I, you know, I think if you step above the subject, really it's about aligned strategy. Um, and, and your ESG strategy, just from my perspective, really needs to be aligned with your overall mass, overall asset management uh, strategy uh, and philosophy. Uh, we personally think that ISO 55000 compliance is an excellent framework and methodology to accomplish it um, at a policy level. It gets lots of different stakeholders of the business talking, the, the C-suite and the operational suite and the, the financial folks. And as you put together your strategic asset management plan, the, the synergies between asset management and ESG governance um, just jump out like super visible um, opportunities for the company. So that, you know, I, I think that that would be one great way to start is have that discussion about ISO 55000 at your operation and um, use the, the principles there to align the strategies. That sounds like great advice, Paul. Uh, we continue to guide our listeners and clients back to the whole concept of asset management being an intentional strategy aligned with the other business objectives and using the, IS, uh, the ISO 55000 architecture is a great way to do that. So how might businesses use ESG and smart manufacturing practices together? Do you see a link there? I do, um, you know, and I, I, I think the best way again is to just use some examples and, you know, really at the core of, of what you're doing in a, in a smart manufacturing approach is you're doing things right the first time, right? And you're eliminating waste and you're eliminating rework. So some very basic ways are to adopt processes that enable you to do things right the first time. So good planning and scheduling processes reduce a tremendous amount of waste and rework in environments where they're practiced well. Another example is to use proven capital management processes that deliver projects that are designed for lowering the total life cycle cost of the assets that are being installed. I'm personally just shocked at when I go to so many different manufacturers and I see the installations that their capital projects processes have put into place and the poor operational people are struggling with these just abominations of, of, of capital execution. And, and it's, uh, it's a symphony of, um, of, of waste and frustration, both on, the, uh, on the, the physical asset side and on the people side. You know, a, another great example is to use proven techniques in managing your shutdowns and turnarounds and outages to reduce contractor labor and overtime. Get that startup time reliably so you can get back to production and delivering products to your customers. You know, when you've, when you've got uh, uh, contractors and diesel trucks and uh, cranes sitting around, uh, there's no uh, more vivid reminder about how costly um, poor planning is. So, you know, those, those, those processes that allow you to do basic things right the first time are going to be well served. And really, that's at the core of what's in uh, good asset management practices. I really like that you reinforce that message that leaders can't ignore uh, how important their asset management strategy is to their overall organizational success. You know, it might not be an obvious uh, direct link if you're not directly involved with what's happening in your manufacturing plant. But if you can see the connection between asset management and organizational success, plus get all the other benefits of it, uh, I think it's really important for managers and uh, leaders to reinforce their involvement of asset uh, management strategy in their overall strategic planning. Well, I suspect their boards are going to help them to uh, understand that uh, that much more fully. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray for reliability. <laughs> So what guidance would you give our listeners about proactive first steps? You know, because there's not a regulatory framework and a, and a hard and fast uh, standard around this, you know, 
companies have been focused on, on either expanding or contracting or, or manufacturing efficiently for so long. I think everybody's trying to figure out like what, what does incorporating ESG principles into our business criteria look like? So one, one thing I would tell you clearly is that learn from others who are farther down the ESG journey. Um, many, many Fortune 500 companies now um, uh, uh, publish and distribute sustainability reports and they're available on their websites. Um, so, you know, I think in going from learning from companies that have been doing this well and for a long time, they're a great source of information. Uh, Owens Corning, as I mentioned earlier, they have an excellent one. Uh, Delta Airlines also has an excellent one. So I think those are great uh, starting points for a company that's trying to align those two realms. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, it's obvious, Paul, that you've spent so much of your career right down where the work is being done and our uh, listeners and certainly our clients uh, get the benefit of that. So there's so much great information. Uh, I've tried to summarize a few things for our audience so they can uh, use them as takeaways from our episode. Uh, first, I would say traditional pressures of margin, production output, market share, profit generating, they're still important, but the list now includes things like carbon emissions characterization, and a meaningful ESG strategy. I would say that if you're in a high carbon footprint industry, you run the risk of not attracting reinvestment from capital markets. Uh, I would say that a great asset management program includes improving the reliability of your assets to not only save you money for your current financial performance, but it will enable the success of ESG goals and other goals. Tap into the power of your people. Uh, educate them on the relationship between high levels of reliability and the attainment of ESG goals. There are some tremendously passionate people in your operations who could blow you away with how much energy they can muster for these efforts. Uh, life cycle engineering is one of those partners you can turn to, uh, right? When you said learn from others, people have already been down this road. Well, no Would you say life cycle is good, well positioned to help our uh, clients with this effort? Well, I certainly think we can share our perspective. And I, I would certainly not say that we are a group of ESG experts and so forth, but we do understand asset management extremely well. We do understand how organizations transform into becoming highly reliable. And we do know very concretely that those two things are absolutely enabling for your ESG efforts. So um, we think we can uh, certainly help you with strategies that'll help both of those endeavors. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paul, uh, for leading us through this emerging topic. Listeners, if you'd like to learn more about this topic, head to lce.com. Thank you so much for joining us, Paul. Until next time, listeners, let's stay smarter, people.